Hello, my name's Keith Rucker. Thought I'd do something a little different today. Uh, I've been working in a shop over the weekend, uh, but pretty much all my machining work that I've been doing has been repeat work of stuff I've already done videos on. I'm rebuild, still working on rebuilding that second pair of infeed rollers, and a lot of the videos that I've already posted were when I rebuilt the first set, and they're all pretty much exactly the same, so I really didn't see a big need to uh, reshoot a lot of that same videos that you guys have already seen how I do some stuff. So uh, I thought for today, just to get a video up, uh, we'd do something. I'd give you a, a toolbox tour of my toolboxes. This is something I've had a couple of requests for to come in uh, over email and over uh, private messages on YouTube. So Keith, we'd really like to see what's in your boxes. Uh, and this is something too that uh, I think a lot of the other guys have been doing on their channels and I think people want me to kind of follow suit. Uh, you know, uh, Keith Finner kind of started all this uh, when he did what, the What's in Your Box series where he showed some of the stuff in his toolboxes and started putting together the great uh, machinist toolbox giveaway that he did last year. And I don't know if he's going to do that again this year or not. I kind of hope he does. Uh, but in follow-up to that, there have been several other guys on YouTube that have done uh, toolbox tours. So I'm going to join in the fray and give you guys a, uh, a quick tour of my toolboxes. Um, a little bit of history, I guess, about my toolboxes that I have here. Uh, I have several toolboxes that I have uh, uh, accumulated over the years, but my very first uh, box of machinist tools was actually this wooden box right here. And I've got it here. This is actually my box that I keep at home uh, in my shop there. Uh, I don't have a lot of machinist tools in here right now because most of my machinist tools are up here at the museum where I'm actually using them and I prefer to keep them in these metal Kennedy boxes up here just a little more secure and I, I just don't like the fact of leaving this antique wooden box out here uh, where it's a little more accessible to the public. Uh, but I acquired this toolbox back in uh, 1997. I remember that because my wife was uh, pregnant with my first daughter at the time and um, I had been looking for a wooden box for a while to put some of my, my tools in. She knew that I'd been looking for one. I've been searching eBay and places like that uh, back then looking for one and just hadn't been able to find one. Well, she was uh, looking for a piece of furniture for the house. I think it was a little curio cabinet or something to put some of her knickknacks in. And uh, she had found out about an antique auction uh, that they were going to be holding uh, not far from where we live um, in a nearby town. And, it was an auction that is typically geared more toward where antique stores come in. So pickers go up north or wherever they find all this antique furniture, they bring it back down south and they, and they basically would turn around and sell it to other antique stores. Uh, it was open to the general public, but it really wasn't advertised for the general public. It was really more advertised to the antique stores. Well, sometime or another, my wife found out about it and decided she'd go over there and just look and see what they had. Um, because she kind of felt like she could maybe get a little better deal than at a regular uh, auction that was op more open to the public, more accessible. Well, I got a phone call uh, while she was there. She says, hey, Keith, uh, there's this uh, wooden machinist box like you've been looking for, and it's full of tools. Well, let's just say I was at work, uh, and I, it was about lunchtime. I knew where the auction was at. I, instead of going to eat lunch, I, I rode out there. They were going to start auctioning things off shortly after lunch. I went over and started pulling the drawers out of this thing, and every drawer was just full of different tools and, and um, just miscellaneous stuff, uh, all kinds of uh, micrometers and just uh, indicators, you name it. I mean, it wasn't, I guess, it, it was full of stuff. It wasn't just jam full, but there was a lot of tooling, uh, a lot of nice uh, tooling in this box. And um, anyway... I was over there looking at it, trying to go through the drawers, you know, try not to act like I was too excited, you know, just kind of trying to look like I was casually looking at it. Well, I told my wife when I got through, I said, honey, you know, if I went and bought those tools new, I mean, there's a couple thousand dollars worth of tools in there. I said, you know, if you can buy it, you know, we didn't have a lot of money at the time. Uh, we were getting ready to have a baby, uh, hadn't been married for very long. You know, I kind of said, all right, you know, if you can get it for under $250, buy it. Well, the auction came around and, and, uh, most of the people there were looking for furniture. Uh, she had one person that was bidding against her on it. And uh, he came up to her afterwards and said he kind of felt sorry for her because she was literally nine months pregnant. And there she was bidding on this box against this guy. And I think she paid $125 for it. Uh, and it was, like I said, full of tools. Um, the bad, I guess the, the, the funny side of the story is, is that when she got home, 
Um, she didn't find what she was looking for, but she bought this for me, and she was kind of upset and giving me a hard time about it, about how uh, you know, she had wasted her day. She'd been looking for something for her, and ended up buying something for me, and blah, 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 blah. Well, I was so excited like a kid in candy store after I got home from work that evening and was going out there digging through the box and uh, just looking to see what I could find. And in this top right-hand drawer back here in the very back, and all, everything's not in here like it was now, but I was digging through, and there was just a bunch of just little things, little screws, uh, you know, just stuff that ends up in a toolbox, washers, uh, little pieces of, of a high-speed steel. Just, just, it was just full of little bits and pieces of stuff. But when I was digging around in there, I found a uh, man's wedding band. And the only thing I could figure is, you know, you're not supposed to wear jewelry in a shop. Maybe he took the ring off, stuck it in the toolbox, and, uh, you know, for whatever reason, that's just where it stayed. Well, I went back in and showed her that, that wedding band, and she got real excited because, again, she was nine months pregnant. Uh, let's just say she was a little swollen at the time, and none of her jewelry would fit her. She slid that man's wedding ring onto her finger, and it fit perfectly. So suddenly, this toolbox went from buying tools for me to buying jewelry for her, and everything was fine with the world. And it, it's funny because now, uh, that's been almost 17 years ago, uh, after she had my first daughter, she had that ring resized where it actually fit her in her normal state. And she still wears that from time to time when she doesn't feel like wearing her engagement set, but she'll just slip that, that ring on. Uh, so anyway, funny story about this box. Uh, as far as what's in this box right now, like I said, this is kind of my box at home. And what I have in here is a lot of my duplicate stuff um, that... Um, just to have some tools at home, I do need to do some measuring. And I've got some of the original stuff that was in here that I wanted to keep with this box. And it's mostly empty, but real quickly, let's just go through it. We'll start with this drawer right here. So if you look in here, and this is just some paperwork. And the main reason that I kept this is uh, because if you look at this, this is a little notepad from Starrett, uh, and But when you look in the back, it has a calendar. Um, well... There's this right there, 1969, 1970. So I kind of feel like that was probably about the last time this box was used. And you know, ironically, there's another little notepad in here. It says uh, uh, Macero Machine Works Incorporated, I think, M-A-S-S-A-R-O from uh, uh, Darby, Pennsylvania. And it also has a little calendar on the front of the notepad, 1969, 1970. So that is probably when this box got put up. Uh, if, if the person who was using it retired, passed away, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, that's when it got put up. It does have the original key uh, that fits the front on here. So the front comes up and uh, goes in here and the lock still works. If I can get it in there. It's a little finicky. Got to go in just right. Maybe I'm using it upside down. There we go. So it does still lock. And uh, I, was, I was proud that it had this, the original key in, even though I don't use it very much. It also had this little uh, trigonometry tables in here, little pamphlet with all your sines and cosines and stuff. You know, I thought that was kind of funny because, uh, you know, now you just use a pocket calculator and, and look this stuff up. But... Uh, back in the in the late 60s, early 70s, you had to do things a little bit more manual. And you know, when I was in in school, at least in uh, my younger grades, we didn't have calculators. We had to do it this way too. Uh, by the time I was graduating, calculators were a little bit more accessible. But anyway, and in the back, there's some some good uh, information here on on gears and just some general machine shop type stuff. Uh, and this here is just a little um, chip volume speed and feed calculator, a little slide rule uh, for Kern and Trekkie. Uh, this wasn't in the box originally, but something I've put in here since. Someone sent me a couple of these for my uh, Kern and Trekkie mill. Uh, and anyway, it's a little slide rule that you can look up feeds and speeds on. You know, this is another thing, just uh, remembering when I was growing up, uh, these little... Uh, uh, slide rule things. We used to have these for all kinds of things, metric conversions, multiplication tables where you could look on here on one thing and just slide it along and find the answer. And nowadays, uh, you know, my kids wouldn't know what to do with this because, you know, they've got calculators, they've got 
smartphones with an app that, <laughs> that do all this stuff right here. Maybe we need to develop a Kerner and Trekkie speed and feed app for our our phones to carry around. All right, so uh, just in here, just some miscellaneous taps and dies. I think those are actually metric stuff there from a, a cheap tap and die set that I got somewhere along the way. Um, there's a scale and a couple of key chucks in here. Uh, I think these drawers are empty right now. Okay, this is my Allen wrench drawer. Um, you know, I uh, when I got this box, it was, this drawer actually had Allen wrenches in it. And since then, I just every time I get a spare Allen wrench, I I throw it in here a loose one. And now, uh, a lot of times when I need an Allen wrench, I just go pull this drawer out and carry it over to wherever I need to go to, and uh, find one that fits. So I still use that at home a lot. That drawer's empty, and uh, in here. Uh, I've got, oh, why don't we set it up here. In here I've just got a, a, a second pair of Starrett dial calipers um, that I use at home. Uh, I got a pair that I keep in my main box that I use up here at the museum. I will say on, on calipers, you know, this is probably just something for personal preference, but um, I, I like the dial calipers. I see a lot of guys using the digital calipers. This one here had got a little chip or something in it and the dial got over, but it still works just fine. But, um, you know, I guess I, I I grew up using these back when I first started in the machine shop. Uh, the dial calipers really weren't that available and uh, the ones that were out there were just super expensive at the time. I learned how to use a dial caliper and I just, I prefer a dial caliper over um, the, the, the digital ones. And I think a lot of that is, is you know, this is kind of like reading a clock. Same thing. I like a, a uh, analog clock rather than a digital clock because I can, I can look at the dial and see where it is in relation to the numbers. And, and it just kind of gives me in my mind a visual reference as to how far I got to go when I'm shooting for a certain measurement. Uh, that may be crazy, you know, but that's that's kind of the way I look at it. Same with, with time. When I look at a clock and it's a, you know, a quarter after, I can visually just look up there and see the big hands on three and, and, and just kind of estimate in my head how far I've gotten to the hour, how far we enter in the hour. But that's just a personal preference thing. Here's a uh, little Starrett uh, zero to one mic. Uh, this was in the toolbox when I got it. Uh, this, uh, I've, I've added the case to it later, but that's the mic I have been using until I just recently got the mic set that I bought the other day. So put that drawer back in and the bottom drawer. This one also uh, just has some more mics in it. There's a, a one to two mic, also a Starrett. Um, and this mic also, uh, as well as the this uh, two to three over here, all these mics were in this box originally. Uh, I have added the cases to them. I like to keep my micrometers and my, my precision measurement tools in a case. Uh, I just feel like that you need to protect them and I don't like to just throw them into a drawer randomly. Um, so anyway, I picked up some cases at some point in time to put these in and I uh, prefer to keep them in, in the cases. So anyway, that's my old uh, wood machinist toolbox and uh, I used this box for many years uh, until uh, I really started out growing it, um, uh, and that's when I picked up some of these other boxes that I'll tell you about in a minute. And now most of my tools have transitioned over to the metal boxes. Again, more so just because I, they're out here where I'm working. Um, whenever I get my shop moved back home, I'll probably put more back in these wooden boxes because I just like the look and the feel and touch of wood over uh, metal. Um, so anyway, I, I, I love this old box. Don't know who made it. Uh, there's no markings on it as far as a manufacturer. Uh, I've taken it literally apart. Uh, looking, the only the only thing on these is on the drawers. All of them have 63 on it, uh, which tells me that they were probably putting together a bunch of them at one time. And this was uh, unit number 63 in that batch that they were doing on that day. And uh, that was just to keep everything. They could put them back in the right box. They probably made them to fit uh, the individual box. So anyway, my old original wood box. So this is my main toolbox that I use now. Um, this is a, a Kennedy uh, stack of boxes. Um, the little backstory on this was the, the top box and one of the intermediate boxes, I think it was actually this intermediate box, 
Um, I was at a, uh, an old woodworking machine, uh, the Iron Fest that we do every year, which is a little get together we do up in, uh, uh, outside of Chicago every year at the Illinois Railway Museum. And we have a little swap meet before the thing gets started on Saturday morning where people bring stuff out and have for sale. And uh, that particular year, I had some stuff that I was selling off the tailgate of my truck. And um, um, across from me was a guy, and I noticed he had uh, uh, the two boxes over there. Well, I went over and looked at them, and he had a price on them. Um, and I thought they were kind of nice and really didn't want to spend the money on them. And I sat over there and watched them all day long or all morning long while we were doing the swap meet and um, basically said, you know, I think I need to go ahead and get those. And I, and I did. I'm glad I did now. Uh, when we were putting stuff up at the end of the swap meet, I went over. He still had them. And uh, I think I ended up paying $75 for the two boxes. Uh, they were, you know, they weren't perfect. The paint's a little bit messed up on that one drawer there, uh, but, you know, in pretty good shape altogether. So I brought these boxes home, and uh, like I said, eventually I started moving my tools toward these. Um, also, eventually, uh, you know, quickly, when I started bringing all my tooling out here to the museum, I'm like, you know, at home I had stuff just stashed all over the place. I needed a cabinet I could lock stuff up in out here at the museum. So I wanted to get a, a rolling bottom box for it and uh, started, you know, on Craigslist, eBay, whatever, looking for those. And, and uh, there was a guy down in Tampa, Florida that had a complete set of the bottom box here. And it was this intermediate box and another top box just like this. He had a whole set of them. And, and he, he had a pretty reasonable price on them, but you know his, his kicker was, was no shipping, got to pick up, local pickup only, which is often the kiss of death on eBay. Well, I knew that I had to make a trip to Tampa. It was about six weeks out. And I just kept kind of watching them, kept kind of watching them. And you know he'd run the auction, had to buy it now, and it wouldn't sell. And then he'd come up the next time and the price would drop a little bit and the price would drop a little bit. Well, it got up about a week before I was going. I pulled it up, and and uh, he had all these boxes listed. Uh, I think it was for $250 uh, for all three of them. And uh, anyway, I gave him a, I emailed him. I actually gave him a call and said, hey, I'm going to be down there in about a week. Uh, can you hold them until then? I went ahead and paid for them immediately. And uh, uh, when I was making a trip down there for work, uh, on the way home, I just swung by this guy's place, picked them up, threw them in the back of the truck, and uh, and got these boxes. No tooling in them, it was just the boxes by themselves. So anyway, I ended, now I've got uh, two top boxes, two intermediate boxes, which I, I've got stacked on top of one another here, and then the, uh, the bottom box. Uh, and we'll go through this real quick. So up in the top section is just mostly some miscellaneous junk. Uh, this is the catch-all place. So I've got the operator's manual for my digital readout for my... Uh, uh, milling machine uh, in here. Uh, this is my my drafting book where I keep a, a scale drawings of all my projects as you can see. Uh, you know I took drafting in high school uh, and even took a, a, a drafting course in college and it was all pen and paper and I learned an awful lot about making drawings but when I do them now it's usually these little cartoon drawings. I can read my own handwriting. You may not be able to. So anyway, just some miscellaneous little parts up here. There's some aluminum tap magic. There's another feed and speed calculator. A uh, little uh, metric, can, or not metric, but decimal equivalent chart. Some dichem that uh, I don't hardly ever use now that I use the blue Sharpie. I've had this for probably 20 years. Uh, so anyway, that's just kind of a catch-all up there. Uh, this drawer here. Uh, I've got a set of punches in here, center punches and just punches. These are some, uh, these are from Union Tool Company. I thought, bought those at a swap meet or something at some point for not much. Anyway, and there's a set of Sterrett center punches. And here's some machinist wedges. These are handy little, uh, these little wedges are, are pretty handy if, uh, for setting up parts on the mill or whatever when you just need to put something under it. You can actually take two of them and slide them together like parallels and uh, tighten stuff up. Those get used a lot. Um, in here, uh, I've got just a few end mills and milling machine related stuff. Uh, I've, I've actually got a uh, end mill dispenser. Uh, I, I bought out a, got a really good deal on, bought out a guy who had just bought a whole bunch of just, he was cleaning out a business that was going out of, out of business. And they had a storage room that was just full of 
mostly junk, but for whatever reason, there was a bunch of machinist tooling in there. And he bought everything with the condition that he had to clean it up, paid a couple hundred bucks. I mean, got a really sweet deal. He knew that I would use the machinist tools. He gave me a call, and, and let's just say that I got all that machinist tooling from him for a couple hundred dollars. I basically paid what he paid to, for everything, and he was happy. I was thrilled, and I, you know, I probably got over 100 brand new end mills, various sizes, and I got those in an end mill dispenser over there. Uh, but these are some other various uh, end mills. Uh, got a lot of other tooling out of that. Middle box here, box here. Uh, this is for my machinery's handbook. So uh, this is something that every every machinist should have. If you don't have a machinery machinery's handbook, uh, go get you a copy. This is the eleventh edition, I think nineteen yeah nineteen forty three. Uh, I like this older one uh, because I do a lot of restoration work on older machinery. And a lot of this information that's in these older books is not in the newer books because it's, it's quite honestly obsolete. But because I'm working on old machinery a lot, I can find a lot of the older stuff in these older cop versions of this. So uh, for me, an old copy is what I like. Uh, 1943 is a, a good uh, time frame for what I like because they still have the old stuff in there, but also have a lot of the newer stuff in there, relatively newer stuff in there. So, but anytime you need any information, you know, if you if you got an oddball uh, uh, tap, you need to know what size hole to drill, you can look it up in here. If you're doing press fits, need to know what interference. There's tables in here. Any kind of information like that is in this machinery's handbook. And in case you didn't know, this this drawer, this this drawer right here on the chest, um, you know, if if this. It's made for your machinery's handbook to go down inside. Uh, some of the wooden boxes had one where the, the book stood up on the end. It was more of a long, narrow slot. But that's what that box is for right there. It's for your copy of the machinery's handbook. All right, this uh, one up here again is just kind of Allen wrenches. Uh, I've got some sets in here. Uh, and then these are for, you know, exchanging out uh, the carbide inserts on my tools or whatever. Every time I get one, I get a new one, so it gets thrown up in here. And uh, there's a few miscellaneous uh, Allen wrenches in there. Uh, this is my scale drawer, primarily scale drawer. So um, I got some miscellaneous six inch scales in here. There's some, uh, some of these little depth scales. There's one by General. Uh, you know, got my hook scale. These are real handy. Uh, Adam talks about, Adam Booth talks about his hook scale all the time. I really like this because you can just hook it right up to the edge of something and, and make a good measurement. So uh, I've had this one for a long time. That one's a stare at. Um, here's a little angle gauge in here for measuring angles. Uh, uh, this is an interesting little thing. This was in that original toolbox, that wooden box that I got. This is for clamping two scales together. So if you, um, if you've got two six inch scales or a 12 inch scale and you want to make a longer one, you just uh, come in here and tighten that down with the thumb screw. And uh, you butt another scale right up next to it on the other side. Do the same thing. These scales, these machina scales, are the length on them is, is dead on. So now I've got a 12 inch scale. Uh, and you can take a 12 inch scale and a 6 inch scale. You can take scales of, uh, don't have to be the same. Uh, you know, you can take a narrow scale and a, and a wide scale and, and put them together. Here's a narrow scale. So if I wanted to put that one in there up against it, same thing. It's completely adjustable. So anyway, that's a uh, stare at number 299, uh, in case anybody's looking for it. It was case hard and you can still see the coloring in there. Anyway, that's a handy little tool to have. Um, let's see, I got my little... Uh, dovetail tool or, or bird mouth tool, whatever you want to call that for setting up for threading. Anyway, that's my scale drawer. Uh, this drawer, I have center drills in here. Uh, I've got some uh, counter sinks in here. Here's some counter bores and a couple of keyway cutters. Again, I got a, I got a complete set of keyway cutters. I got a complete set of, uh, of these uh, counter bores and counter sinks, all that. That was all stuff that was in that big batch of stuff that I got from this guy and um, anyway I've got tons of that most of it's in other places but this is just some miscellaneous stuff uh, drilling mostly drilling related although they've got a couple of key sets in there 
This is more uh, measuring and layout tools here. So um, uh, I've got my, my stair at square. Here's some dividers and what have you in here. Um, some Sharpies, a little carbide scribe for uh, laying stuff out. Um, have a protractor head and I got a complete set. This is a stair at a, um, oh goodness, I can't even think the name of it, but the, the set that's got the, the square, the, the center and the protractor. There's another cheap square in there uh, as well. But these are mostly layout tools in this drawer. Coming on down, uh, not a lot in here right now. Recently, this is where I used to have uh, my, my mics that are in my other toolbox now uh, that you saw a while ago. But when I got picked up that new set of uh, uh, zero to six inch micrometers the other day, I took those out of here and put them in the wood box that I keep at home. So this drawer is kind of empty, but I do have my set of uh, telescoping gauges in here. I use these all the time for inside measurements. And these are some, these were both uh, in that original wooden toolbox that I had. Uh, there's a small set of telescoping gauges um, not a whole big range. I used these for years until I picked up the full set. Uh, these are made by Oldak, O-L-D-A-K, uh, which is in England. Uh, anyway, like I said, that was in my wooden box and also same company, same brand, Oldak, uh, some small hole gauges uh, that I use. These you can uh, take and insert into a hole. Uh, you expand them and use them kind of like a telescoping gauge different though but you can measure a small hole and then use your micrometer to get an accurate measurement on them and uh, let's see I got a calculator in here a deburring tool and that's a little jig I made one time for making these little plastic discs which is for a sight glass on my uh, current trekking mill uh, I had some I need to replace some so I just made some all right we go down to my first intermediate box um, and I have in here my 12-inch uh, um, uh, caliper, style calipers. These are stared as well. Uh, these don't get used a lot, but sometimes you know you just you just need this bigger set, and this you just go. I, I got a nice set here. I can go grab. Here's some angle blocks um, and a couple of uh, of uh, oh goodness uh, speed indicators or tachometers. Uh, then here, this is a stare at one, and uh, this is a brown and sharp one. I think this brown and sharp one was in that original toolbox that I got. And this is one that I picked up somewhere else along the way. Uh, I saw something recently about, uh, I think uh, Adam Booth was uh, doing a video where he visited his brother, or his, uh, his friend, uh, um, oh, I can't even think of his name right now, but they had one of these, and he says how to use them. And I actually use these quite a bit uh, for on machinery when I want to know what speed it's running. I'll go grab one of these, but it's fairly simple. Um, you just take this uh, little rubber tip and you put it up into the center hole of whatever shaft or whatever you're running, and it's going to start spinning. And um, as it goes around, you watch it. You, uh, you, you start out on this one where these two dots line up with one another, and that's a zero. And every time it makes a complete revolution and goes by there, it's 100 RPMs, and then you can read on here. The, uh, it's got a, a scale on here to read the exact number. So you just go in there and you know let it run for one minute or 30 seconds and double the number, however you want to do it. And again, you just watch how many revolutions it makes. You start out with it lined up here, and you know that's 100, and then you just read on here 160, 140, whatever. Uh, this brown and sharp one, uh, it actually still has the original instructions in here with it. The brown and sharp vest pocket speed indicator, number 746. But uh, it works very similar, except there's a little. The, you read it up here at the top, and there's there's two scales, and uh, you, you you put this on zero. The reason there's two scales is that depending on which way it's turning, uh, it's either going to count up or down. Uh, so uh, you know this one here says 10 and 90, which is you know the opposite of one another. But you do the same thing. On this one, there's a little button in here. When it makes a revolution, it lifts the surface of this, and you can feel it with your thumb. So you just put your thumb right over that, and you count how many times the, this little cover lifts up. So it works basically the same as the, the stare at one. Um, I actually like this one a little bit better because I can feel it uh, with my hand uh, for the 100 increments 
whereas with the uh, stare at one I have to watch it and sometimes you're down in the hole or whatever where you really can't can't watch it very well I guess on here you could use your thumb to to feel that that dot go by as well but anyway that's how you use a uh, a uh, speed indicator all right this is my uh, uh, drawer full of uh, let me rearrange that camera a little bit this is my drawer full of um, indicators and uh, so just my stare at dial indicator right there this is my go-to workhorse indicator that I use most of the time um, this one here is just a little cheap import with a magnet on it uh, that I use on the lathe a lot of times when I'm got something coming in. Uh, you know, that's a twenty dollar indicator. You know, the you can buy some pretty nice indicators for real cheap money out there now. Uh, and for just a workhorse indicator that you're going to not worried about getting banged up or what another. You know, these little things are not bad. Um, but I've got my nice Starrett in here that uh, that I use. I guess when things are maybe a little bit more critical. Uh, I've also got another indicator. Uh, I just sent it off the other day. It came with the original box. Uh, it was made by, um, oh goodness. Well, it's, it's leaving me who that one was made by. I'll, I'll shoot a video on that when it comes back. But anyway, it's, it's an old, old indicator uh, that was, I mean, it's, well, it came out of that box, so it's at least 40 years old. But the whole base on the bottom, the, 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 the bottom down here, which most of these are real, you know, pop metal or aluminum, it was made out of solid steel. I mean, it is just a real heavy indicator, and uh, the, the crystal was gone on it. It still worked, um, but I had never used it. And I, I got online the other day, and lo and behold, the company that makes it still in business. I sent them an email. They said, yeah, send it back to us. So uh, uh, they're going to put a new crystal on there and probably maybe do go through it and just... Uh, make sure it's still in good shape but I'm, I'm kind of excited because it's just a really nice heavy indicator so this is my uh, last word indicator test indicator I love this little last word indicator I use this for a lot of uh, tramming in vices you know setting things up this has kind of become my favorite go-to test indicator I know there's better ones out there but I just I just like this little last word and 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 use it all the time um, I've had that for quite a while. Uh, there's another little, uh, this is a federal test indicator. This was in that wooden box when I got it. Uh, it still works. This little tip on the end was broken off of it and I found a replacement uh, for that and uh, kind of got this one refurbished. And I use it occasionally. It has the dovetail uh, connectors on there which I can use with my uh, Noga uh, holder which has uh, the dovetails in it. So I may actually start using this a little bit more uh, with that Noga holder. Uh, this is my uh, inside uh, hole attachment uh, that I've showed how to use on, on a couple of videos. So uh, anyway, I won't go into that right now. And then this is a uh, Blake uh, coaxial indicator for setting up a, a hole uh, or a bore or something where you want to get it running true. And uh, I won't go into how to use that, but that's a handy little tool. It doesn't get used a lot, but when you need it, Man, it sure is nice. And there's my Noga holder. I've got a Starrett holder laying around somewhere else right now. It's not in the box. But anyway, this is my indicator drawer. Moving on down, uh, some more measuring tools. I got some 12-inch uh, scales in here. Uh, this is a set of uh, depth micrometers. Um, Shear Tumaco, S-C-H-E-R-R-T-U-M-I-C-O. Uh, I'm not sure how you pronounce that. I, I got a, 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 a one to two mic was in that set of mics that I got the other day, uh, made by the same company. Uh, this was in the, the wooden uh, machinist box that I bought, uh, but a real nice uh, set of, uh, of uh, depth micrometers, uh, and I use this occasionally uh, when I need it. And uh, then I've got my other set of Starrett dial calipers in here. It's in a beat up box, uh, but this box, uh, this case actually has sentimental value to me. Back uh, when I worked in the machine shop uh, in the late 1980s, um, um, there were me and a couple other guys, we were all just basically right out of high school that were working in there, uh, 
kind of an apprenticeship type program and none of us had any tools and we had a couple of pairs of uh, shop uh, uh, calipers, style calipers, and it seems like every time you needed them, someone else had them. We were running around the shop always trying to find it. Well, one day my boss came in and me and the other guy, who was a good friend of mine, uh, he, he gave both of us a set of uh, dial calipers in this Starrett box that they go in. Uh, unfortunately, I, the, the set of calipers got messed up a long time ago and it was going to cost more money to fix them than they were worth, so I just replaced them with a new set. But the case, even though it's worn out and got a little bit of rust on it and whatever, I still keep it because it's just a, a memory. You know, that was something that that Virgil gave me, the guy that, that I learned from. Uh, that's probably the only thing I really had that he gave me, uh, but it, it has a lot of sentimental value to me. All right, and this box here uh, is just mostly just some miscellaneous tools, some wrenches, a uh, big crescent wrench, there's a three quarter inch wrench, uh, half inch drive socket, there's some eight point sockets. I do a lot of work on, again, old machines that have square head bolts, so this is my personal set of eight point sockets. Uh, you know, I've got other tools that I can go grab, but these are just some that I keep in here. Uh, just a little, neat little hammer. A friend of mine gave that to me the other day. I thought that's neat. Uh, this is um, a compass set. Uh, nothing super fancy, but when I took drafting, uh, when I was in high school, I had to have a little uh, compass set, and this was this was a set that I had. And I use this all the time for layout, even though it's not. It's really made for drawing on paper. Uh, there's 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 points in here for metal. I use it in woodworking. Um, anyway, another one. I've had this for probably 30 years. You know, it's nothing high dollar or fancy, but it's been with me a long time. I do have in this drawer uh, my Starrett machinist level. So this is for setting up machines or whatever where you want to get it perfectly level. I need to turn that where it's to protect it, but that's a nice little tool to have when you need it. Don't use it a lot, but it sure is nice to have. All right, we'll move down to the bottom box. Okay, so now we're in the bottom box. My bottom box is, generally speaking, more tooling uh, than it is uh, measuring tools or what have you. Um, again, I've only got a limited amount of space to keep all my stuff, so a lot of my stuff goes in down here. But anyway, I thought you guys would enjoy seeing this. So this top drawer is uh, mostly lathe uh, tools, um, what have you, turning tools. I got a couple different just indexable sets. These were stuff that I bought for my smaller lathe when I used to run it. And this is the tooling I've been using on this bigger lathe until I just got that uh, CA um, holder. And anyway, this is a new uh, left hand tool for that one uh, boring bar, just some miscellaneous uh, tooling, uh, some high speed steel, some carbide cutters, a bunch of, car, uh, a bunch of inserts. Uh, miscellaneous insert. So anyway, this is my uh, mostly lathe tooling drawer, but also where I keep all my inserts at. Uh, next drawer down. So this drawer I keep files in uh, and a few other things. You know, I, I, I will say on files, um, I, I love files. <laughs> files are one of those things, I don't know, whenever I'm at a flea market or somewhere they have some files, I'll almost always buy them uh, if they're in decent shape, particularly if they're good American made. Uh, I really like Nicholson USA files and I'll buy these whenever I can. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you guys a little, little, little secret if you don't know, but if you will buy, take old files that you probably consider to be worn out beyond use, there's a place out in California called Boggs Tool Company that has a file sharpening system. I know that sounds crazy. They actually, it's a chemical process that they use that they put these files in and it does something that sharpens the, 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 the file back up. And it's an absolutely amazing service. You know, I was real skeptical about it before I ever used them, but I, I took a bunch of these old flea market files that really and truly, some of them I bought just for the steel. I, I used to do some blacksmithing and you, you know, make some knives or whatever. I bought a bunch of files for that and, and I took that whole box of just wore out files, sent them out there, came back and lo and behold, I mean, they were like brand new files. Uh, so look them up there on the internet, Boggs, uh, Boggs uh, Sharpening Service, Boggs anyway in California. 
and uh, they do a really good job uh, on sharpening files. I've heard of some people say they'll go buy a brand new file and send it in the box because it comes back in better shape than a brand new file. I don't know that I would do that. But um, anyway, I've got a bunch, a lot of files at home. This is just a small selection that I use in this box. Uh, but again, I think I've become a file collector. Uh, these are all um, uh, different uh, counter bores. Again, this was in that, that lot of tooling that I bought from that guy. There's pretty much a complete set here, all new old stock. Uh, I've got some um, assortment of, uh, of uh, Woodruff keys in here. Um, some other just miscellaneous stuff. There's a file card there for cleaning out files. There's some, some brass shims. Some of the stuff just kind of gets thrown in here. Next drawer down. This is my uh, reamer, mostly reamers, also some longer drill bits are in here. Um, but I have a, a bunch of reamers. I got a bunch of reamers out of that tooling uh, that I bought. I got some adjustable reamers in here. I'm not a huge fan of adjustable reamers, uh, but they have their uses. They have their places where they come in handy. So I've got quite a few of them in different sizes. Uh, but regular reamers. This bag here is all taper reamers for taper pins. All those came in that lot of, um, of tooling that I, I got from that guy. Here are just some taper pins themselves. A cheap set of drill bits. It's just kind of a backup in case I can't find the size I need. I've got a, a drill index in here with some Lowe's drill bits. And these are some longer drill bits over here. I see I also got some uh, Morse taper reamers in here. I had a job one time where I was having to put a Morse taper uh, in something, and anyway, I got a, a reamer there to cut Morse tapers. Uh, that's a number three, I think. Yeah, number three Morse taper. Coming on down the list line here, um, some more larger reamers in here. This is mostly milling machine related stuff. Uh, here's a little uh, angle plate. Um, this was in that machinist box, that wooden box that I got. This appears to be a homemade one made by someone, but it's uh, it's dead on. It's it's well made. Um, set of uh, angles for using on the mill. Here's a set of uh, parallels for using on the mill. Uh, there's some shell mills in here, just some miscellaneous cutters. Uh, here's that little grinding wheel I made for my... Um, um, uh, tool post grinder. Uh, I saved that in case I ever need it. Had a video on that a while back. Here's a shell mill. This I use on my horizontal milling machine from time to time. Uh, can't remember where that came from, but anyway, that's a nice, uh, nice shell mill. Um, another cheap set of drill bits that wasn't worth the money I spent on them. I think I only pay like 20 bucks for them and <laughs> they ain't worth that. But I keep them in here just, and you know, sometimes you need a uh, an oddball size and I've got them in here and usually they're good for one use. That's about it. All right, this drawer, uh, here's a, my die grinder, little air power die grinder. This is a little flapper wheel. Uh, I saw Keith Finner. I uh, had a video where he did this, just took a piece of rod, I took a hacksaw, just cut a slot in there, and you take a emery cloth, and you can put this up inside of a bore and uh, clean the inside of a bore up. I use this a lot. Um, got a bunch of carbide burrs here to go with that. Acid brushes uh, for putting oil on the, on, my, on the lathe or whatever. Here's a bunch of dogs for the lathe. Uh, extra R8 collets that go on my uh, Wells Index mill. These are all duplicate sizes that I have. Uh, when I bought the mill, it came with a bunch of them. And I've got a complete set hanging over on the side of the mill. But anyway, these are duplicates. Uh, here's a broach set uh, for broaching out keyways. Um, pretty good size, a pretty good set. And uh, there's a couple of... Um, uh, Broach uh, guides that I've made for different jobs that have come up that I didn't have one exactly like I needed. So these are fairly easy to make. That one's uh, for a one and five eighths inch bore and a one and seven sixteenths inch bore. That one was a long bore. I think that was for the the uh, pulleys. 
that I made. I had to it was a fairly long bore. I had to make a special brooch for it. There's a little machinist adjustment jack that gets used on setups from time to time. Another handy uh, little toy to have. I need some smaller ones of those. All right. These are my lathe tools for uh, my, I think, BXA holder that I've been using on the, on the lathe. These were, again, raw for my 10-inch lathe, and I had a bunch of them set up, and now I'm going to the CA holder. So I'm going to keep those because I, I hope to one day get a smaller uh, lathe just to do smaller work with, so I'll have those already set up, but they're, they won't be used much longer. And then my, uh, my little teeny tiny small end mill collection. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see, there was, a, there was a thread, I think, going on about who had the biggest tap handle between uh, Adam and Tom. Uh, I'd like to maybe see who's got the biggest end mill. <laughs> these, are, these are for uh, my horizontal mill. Let's see what this is. So... So this is a uh, two and a half inch diameter, and that's about six, about eight inches long, and has a two inch shank on it, which uh, I actually have a holder for my horizontal mill that that'll fit into. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, when I bought my horizontal mill, um, I got a bunch of tooling with it. Here's some, here's some smaller end mills. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I like like this one. That's a there's a more traditional looking two flute end mill. I've never used these, but you know you never know. Might have a might have a need for them one day. Uh, so anyway, anybody got a bigger end mill? You can share it with us. Uh, I may have folks beat on that one. How about it, Adam? You got an end mill that big? <laughs> and then my final drawer. Uh, this is mostly horizontal mill stuff. Uh, I got a bunch of spacers back there uh, for setting up arbors. There's some miscellaneous cutters in that box over there. Uh, I got a whole bunch more cutters at home. Um, just don't have room to keep them up here. And then that orange or yellow box there is my boring head uh, that I use on my uh, on my vertical mill or my horizontal mill for that matter. Usually on the on the vertical mill. So. So there you go. Uh, you asked. Uh, there's a tour of my of my toolbox. Uh, I do have another top box like this out here that uh, is kind of tucked away at the museum, and I have a few other little small things in there. Uh, nothing of real interest, but I do keep some miscellaneous stuff in it. Have a lot of uh, bigger drill bits, uh, taps and dies, uh, easy outs, uh, stuff like that. I won't go to to the trouble to show you that one. And then like I mentioned before, um, I have my uh, tap dispenser where I, I'm not tap dispenser, but my end mill dispenser where I have hundreds and hundreds of end mills uh, that I picked up out of that sweet deal I got. And uh, those are over in another spot as well. But that pretty much uh, shows you guys my my toolboxes. Uh, as you can tell, I, I have a thing for Sterrett tools. That they're my favorite. Uh, but I, you know, I, I, I will buy other stuff when I see it. Uh, most of this tooling uh, I bought used. Our tools I bought used. Uh, flea markets, um, swap meets, uh, eBay, Craigslist, places like that. And I hear some people say, hey, I don't, I don't want to buy used something or whatever, micrometer or whatever. I'd rather buy something new. I know the, the history of it. And, uh, you know, I can understand that, uh, particularly if you're in a, 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 you know, commercial shop where you're actually making money. I'm not. I'm in a, uh, you know, these are my personal tools. I'm, I guess, more of a hobbyist machine shop, even though I do my volunteer work here at the museum. I'm making stuff for them, but you know I'm not making any revenue off of this. So a lot of times, you know, I have to get stuff cheap that I can afford. Uh, but just keep this in mind. You know, every tool that you have in your toolbox is a used tool. And uh, some of these people that say I only buy new stuff, well, everything you have in a toolbox is used. And if you're like most machinists, your tools are in good shape. So you know, 
you know, proceed with caution anytime you're buying any kind of tools or tooling, but you can buy a lot of really nice stuff that's been used. Machinists generally took care, real good care of their tools. And, uh, you know, have I ever gotten bitten by something that uh, bought it and, you know, got it in the mail and it, it wasn't really what I was hoping for? Yeah, it's happened. But probably 95% of the time I, I end up getting good tools. I do a little bit of homework. I try to look at the pictures real good. But you can get some good deals out there, guys, um, particularly for the hobby shop guys. You know, keep an eye out and uh, buy the stuff when you can get it. Don't say, oh, I'll get it next time. If something shows up, particularly at a swap meet or a flea market, you know, you have to get it while the getting's good. So if it's something you think you might be able to use, you know, my saying is it's better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. So, you know, a lot of times I'll buy something, particularly if it's at a reasonable price, even though I may not have an immediate need for it. And I can tell you there's a lot of times that I've been happy uh, that I did that. So this video is probably getting kind of long. We'll go ahead and finish it up. Uh, thanks for watching. Thank you for everybody out there who's subscribing. Uh, thank you for the comments that are coming in. Uh, just absolutely uh, always uh, look forward to, to reading your comments. And if you have questions, uh, feel free to ask questions. Uh, I'll do my best to answer them. I may not always have the best answer, but uh, I'll, I'll do my best. And, uh, you know, keep subscribing if you're, if you're, uh, I, it just still blows me away. I, we, we hit 2,000 subscribers uh, on New Year's Day. Uh, today is the uh, uh, January 5th, I think. So, that, you know, four days ago we hit 2,000. I'm already at 2,200 this morning. So uh, uh, we're getting a lot of new folks subscribing to the channel, and I appreciate it, guys. Uh, I really do. And... Anyway, we'll sign off from there.